Hello everyone and welcome to the Permaculture Podcast. As we begin, I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to the Summer to Fall fundraiser. We were able to raise, thanks to some last minute donations, 3900 of the $4,500. That was our goal. And I appreciate everyone who helped with that effort. Because being a member of the new media means that fundraising is a kind of a constant process, similar to public media, but without any kind of governmental support. This really is just me and the team doing what we can to keep the show going. Thank you all for being part of that. If you'd like to find out how you can lend a hand, go to the permaculturepodcast.com and click on the support button at the top of the page. You'll find out more about the Patreon program, as well as ways that you can make continuing or one-time contributions via PayPal. That fundraising is also why we're... That role of fundraising is also why we've partnered with Veranegia Pacifica, who is giving away a complete PDC valued at $1,600 to someone who donates $50 or more to the show between now and December 16th. There are only 64 entries allowed for this drawing. Find out more and how to enter if you're not able to contribute at this time at the Permaculture Podcast forward slash Costa Rica or by the link in the show notes. And thank you. I really couldn't do this work without you. Let's get on to the show. This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann, and you're listening to episode 1642, Rewild or Die. My guest today is Peter Michael Bauer, the executive director of Rewild Portland, returning for what is his third appearance on the show, the most individual interviews that I've had with anybody. Yeah, there are some folks who've appeared a few more times, or at least as many times, but no one who I've actually scheduled separate interviews with to have on. And as always, I had a great time talking with Peter about the reissue of his book, Rewild or Die. Written as a series of blog posts in the mid-2000s, as his persona urban scout, this book touches on dozens of topics within the context of rewilding, such as agriculture versus rewilding, appropriation versus rewilding, resistance versus rewilding, and even urban scout versus rewilding. This is a book, as I mentioned to Peter in our introduction, that I really do wish that I had had early on in my exploration of this idea of rewilding. My earliest exposure to these ideas of human activity dealt with primitive skills. I still have a copy of Richard Graves' Bushcraft, wrapped in a brown paper recover I recycled from a grocery bag, like you might have covered your books when you were in grade school, sitting on my shelf. And that's where I began to learn how to make my own rope and different types of fire that I would then later use as a Cub Scout and a Boy Scout on camping trips. And later, looked at those primitive skills through the lens of experimental archaeology when I was in college, learning how to nap flint during an archaeology and anthropology day at my first university, sitting next to a man who had made his own obsidian scalpel for open-heart surgery. Later, as I was studying resource management, I learned about conservation rewilding and the idea of bringing the wolves back to our national parks. But there was still that missing element between the human and the landscape and the other than human that comes from a hunter-gatherer animist perspective. And I began, and I began exploring those ideas several years ago in my conversations with Peter and Jason Gadeski and others about the long, rich history of humanity living in cooperation with the earth. But in the modern context of transition and permaculture and what it means to live in the bounds of civilization, there were still questions that rewild or die answered for me, or at least started me down a road of inquiry, understanding that this work is 10 years old and a lot has changed since Peter first wrote it, which we explore in our conversation today as we look at the history of rewilding, its current state and where Peter sees it going in the future. If you listen to this at work, or around young children, know that it is a really relaxed, casual conversation between Peter and myself, and does include a bit of adult language. Now then, on to the conversation about Rewild or Die. I'll join you again afterwards. So Peter, you've recently re-released Rewild or Die, and I've got to say that this is a book that I wish I had had in my hands when I first was exposed to this idea of rewilding. I understand that quite a bit has changed for you since 
You originally wrote this as your persona, Urban Scout. Would you like to give us a bit of an introduction to this book and we can take the conversation from there? Yeah, that sounds awesome. I Let's see, Rewild or Die is a collection of essays written in blog form from my website, The Adventures of Urban Scout. And I wrote them over the period of a couple years from about 2006 to 2008. And then I compiled them into a book and officially released the book in 2010. So most of the most of the essays are nearing 10 years or older at this point. And Urban Scout had a, you know, a particular tone that I don't that I don't feel is my tone. There's this sort of artist concept in there of like a muse, you know, and I really feel like Urban Scout was a special voice that I was sort of translating onto paper and wasn't necessarily my own. And that voice is still there in my head, but I don't. Uh, I don't really feed that demon anymore, so to speak. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I have a lot different feelings about things now than when I wrote that book. So it's it's almost like a, a time capsule in a way. But also there's still some really good quality stuff in there. Just in general, I think of rewilding. And uh, I think it still holds value in that regard, especially because sort of my main point with that book was to distill the ideas of rewilding as best as I could to kind of have as short uh, little snippets of the topics as possible without having to go into full detail. You know, I was reading books by people like Derek Jensen at the time and his books are, you know, are 600 to a thousand pages. And I just feel like you should, if you're going to, if you're going to try to get your message across, especially in the modern or contemporary times, it's going to have to be shorter than that if you want to reach a broader audience in, in some regards. So part of my idea was that was like, how can I write about, these topics in a way that covers everything as fast as possible in a short distance as possible. And I feel like I accomplished that to an extent. And that's, you know, I've, I've received feedback, both negative and positive for that. Um, you know, some people have really appreciated the fact that it's these bite-sized pieces that they can, you know, if they're thinking about something or somebody challenges one of their ideas, they can just thumb through it and find a particular page that covers that topic and get a little bit of an idea of how they could create an argument against whatever somebody's trying to, you know, say. But then I've also had the opposite happen where people have been frustrated with the briefness that I've, you know, talked about important topics, you know, that I haven't gone into detail. And I think for me, it wasn't, again, it wasn't really about going into detail. It was about covering a lot of ground in as short amount of time as possible to kind of give people this idea that rewilding is a lens through which to view the world. And in order to do that, I wanted to cover a lot of stuff almost topically and allow other people to go deeper on their own outside of that, but to just broach those topics initially so that people had that in their idea that it was something that you could look at a little differently if you were looking at it through the lens of rewilding. Well, and it's that topic versus rewilding chapter breakdown that you have that touches on dozens of different ideas that all are a part of this conversation that really drew me into it. Not only because as, you know, someone who's busy in the modern world, a father and everything else, who's still fascinated by all of these ideas, it was nice to be able to pick up a little here and a little there. And honestly, mentioning Derek Jensen, most of my exposure to his work was before I had children. And now I can't sit down and, and go through Endgame 1 and 2 again in any reasonable amount of time. Whereas I found, you know, in just those couple of minutes while I was waiting in line, the size of the book, I could pull it out, I could read a couple of pages, review a topic, and then put it away. And I wound up reading most of the book that way, just a little bit here and a little bit there. And most of my exposure to rewilding has been through my direct conversations with you, or Jason Gadeski, Nathan Carlos Rupley, John Darby, some folks we know in common. So it's been a direct kind of transmission of this information, whereas getting to read this almost historical document from a particular place in time in rewilding gave me an earlier perspective and also to see how much things have changed since then. Yeah, one thing I think one of the biggest changes is uh, my perspective on my own privilege. You know, I think in there, in one of the chapters, I said something about how I vote again for <laughs> Uh, how I vote against schools getting money because fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny to me to to think about it in terms of like, you know, an an my, my anarchist perspective. And, but then looking at it years later as somebody who's been looking into my own privilege and things and being able to realize that 
not everybody had the opportunities that I do or did outside of the schooling system. And that, you know, especially now that I work in the nonprofit world and have Rewild Portland, that we're able to go into schools when there is more funding available and give those children a taste of what rewilding might be. And while I would like to see the school system crumble and civilization crumble, obviously, those things are maybe beyond my capability as a human to make happen. And I think that they will happen in time, but I don't think that there's this, uh, I think taking the, the fundamentalist approach to a lot of these things isn't really helping anybody. And I think that that was sort of a, an aspect of fundamentalism that I had that I had not acknowledged yet because I hadn't really done a lot of reflection on my own privileges that I had received and, and continue to receive. And so the idea of, you know, voting against schools to get money is it's just stupid <laughs> on a lot of levels. And uh, so there's things I regret that I said in there, you know, as, that that's one thing that sticks out in particular, uh, especially because I work now in schools with Rewild Portland, bringing aspects of rewilding to the school system and giving children a taste who would maybe never even have that experience or especially in urban, the urban context may never even have been outside before. And so we're able to actually leverage that system to, kind of plant the seed of rewilding through that. And that's something that I didn't really acknowledge back then. I think I was still really angry about the school system and about my own experiences within it. And I wanted to reject it entirely based on my personal feelings without recognizing other people's perspectives and feelings as well. And the, and the larger picture of complexity, you know. I had a conversation recently where someone asked me, how can I, I live and practice permaculture the way that I do without kind of being overrun by the cultural hegemony that we exist within? And my, my first response was, well, because I'm an anarchist and I don't really care. And the, <laughs> the look on their face to hear, hear the A word come out of my mouth was one of shock. And then my other friends who understand this and know this about me are just kind of like, get a smile on their face and nod their head. But, you know, I did follow that up with, even though I have this, this anarchistic ideal, there's still a realistic way to interact with the world that because of my responsibilities, because of my privileges means that I can't just step back and watch it all fall apart or sit there with a bottle of, of gasoline and matches metaphorically and wait for it all to burn down. It was fascinating for me, though, to read the book and over your bio. Now that you're going into school systems, do you talk to them about dropping out of high school and your adventures? <laughs> Funny you should say that. Well, again, back back then, I did work in schools, particularly high schools and things. And I did say, you know, like I talked about my story and there were a couple of teachers who blamed me for several students dropping out. In fact, one teacher that I continue to work with, her son dropped out of high school from the high school where she's a teacher. <laughs> and she said that she blamed me <laughs> and was mad at me for a long time. But obviously we worked through that and he's a, you know, he's whatever in his late twenties now and like bike mechanic extraordinaire and all this stuff. So it's not like that did him any disservice, but again, there's this element of uh, privilege and I don't tell from, from now I don't really tell anybody to do anything other than follow their heart because I think that's sort of the, uh, and, and that might be also bad advice, <laughs> <laughs> but at least it's a feeling, you know, and, and again, there's a Joseph Campbell thing, follow your bliss. I think that that comes from a place of privilege as well. And so on some level, you know, you, you can find a balance of following your heart, but also as somebody with privilege, I can recognize that that's not really enough and that, you know, uh, from time to time, I've always I've always had to work jobs that I don't like. So it's not like I've always been following my heart. I'm always doing things that I, I'm always making compromises because and I think this comes back to everybody. Uh, uh, you know, we live in a state of captivity. And I think a lot of like anarcho primitivists don't or just anybody anarchists don't want to acknowledge that we're captives and they want to lash out against those in power without recognizing that that is essentially suicide. And I think the same thing about like Derek Jensen and that, and the deep green resistance. I think a lot of that, that form of, of resistance, I don't, I'm not going to argue against it. If somebody feels again, if somebody feels that that's the thing they want to do, I'm not, a, I'm not a pacifist in any way. And I, at the same time, think of civilization and the state power as a forest fire and there's no way to put out a forest fire until it hits the point of diminishing returns. You can cut fire lines 
you can try to uh, guide the fire in certain ways, but it's going to burn until there's no more fuel left for it to burn. And if you try to fight a fire while it's ascending, you're going to die probably in that fire. And so there's a sense, I think, of martyrdom in a lot of that culture without recognizing captivity. Because if you recognize the captivity, then you can try to figure out ways of like mitigating the destruction of civilization. And then once it hits the point of diminishing returns, then you can actually start putting it out. But I don't know if we've reached that point yet. And at this point, um, we certainly haven't in the United States. Uh, maybe in certain places, again, if we're looking at it in a, in a complex way, not right here in, in Portland, Oregon, civilization still has a monopoly, a monopoly on violence. But where is civilization retreating, you know, like places like formerly Detroit, um, you know, cities that are already in collapse all around the world, places that are in collapse. It's where the resources have been already extracted and destroyed. And now we're basically waiting while they're destroying resources that are still in existence. But all those places that have been decimated or that are far out, uh, you know, where there's still indigenous people living like the Bushmen and stuff. I think those areas, Jason Gadeski has this really great idea called the closing of the map, which was basically nation states creating maps and drawing lines of power and around resources. And so we have this idea of the map and the closing of the map was basically creating a map of the whole world. And so the map of the whole world shows the basically the territory that civilization controls. As civilization collapses, the map is going to shrink because it won't have control in those far off places. It'll probably shrink around resources that it deems important, like oil, things like that. But in those other places, the map is going to shrink. And so there's this idea of the opening of the map. And to me, I kind of I'm looking at all these things the same. If we look at civilization as a forest fire, then the opening of the map is the point of, that the civilization has reached the, the point of diminishing returns and is now starting to burn down and focus on the areas that are still that still have enough fuel to burn itself out. Um, and in those areas on the fringe there, that's where I think you can be effective at putting the fire out with whatever means. And that's another thing that I talk a lot about in, in Rewild or Die, I think, is, is like the idea of resistance to civilization. And like I said, I still believe in that, and I'm not a pacifist. But the idea of, quote unquote, taking down civilization, I think, is an absurd, impractical idea because of the complexity of civilization. There is no way of taking down civilization. It isn't one thing. Just because I've given this complex, amorphous cultural idea a name doesn't mean I can just eliminate it. You know, and that complexity is something that from the resource management side of things that I'm familiar with, there's a distinction between issues and problems. A problem is something that you can solve readily, you know, through a, a simple policy change or a couple of years of work. But when we want to get to the root of something to really dig in and, and solve something for the long term, that's usually this very complex interwoven issue that has many different moving parts that we can look for leverages in order to have the most impact, but are not something that can be resolved within just a couple of years or even decades. That's what I look at with this issue of civilization or a lot of conversations I'm involved in with late stage capitalism is that we still have generations of belief that have been built into these ideas that historically we can look at them and they're only a few hundred years old. You know, these are the things that our great, great grandparents started working on that we're now living in the results of. And we're going to be the great, great grandparents of those who solve these issues that we're currently a part of. I think it also has to do with urgency, you know, and in the recent issue of um, Black and Green Review by Kevin Tucker, which is an anarcho primitivist journal. In issue number three, he had an interview with Richard Heinberg, who's, you know, one of the big proponents of peak oil and he also wrote that book, Peak Everything. And it's interesting because I had been thinking about peak oil lately and like, what happened about that? Like, nobody talks about that anymore. It's all just climate change. Like, what happened to peak oil? So it was a really great interview with Richard Heidenberg where basically they were saying that, like, what happened? And, you know, we started doing these tar sands projects and these other things that made it look like we've had more, but we haven't. And so people have kind of forgot about it for the last few years. We've had cheap oil and the conversation fell away. 
but that's you know about to change again because all of that stuff is transforming right now as we speak and so it was really great to hear uh or to read rather a, a discussion between kevin and and richard about that topic and see that it's still right there in the forefront and essentially they're they're thinking that peak oil is happening right now or happened last year and that now we're really going to see the descent ex accelerate in the next decade which i think would be great you know i mean again i what having less access to oil means less access to machines that are capable of destroying this planet. So we're going to have to localize environments. Globalization is only possible through oil production. So what that means is there will be reverse of globalization, which is localization, which is an aspect on the path toward rewilding. And uh, of course, that's amazing in my mind. So I'm looking forward to it, even though it will be challenging for everyone, economically, socially, et cetera, to be in a depression since this cultures based on growth. But, you know, I think that that's where the magic is going to come back. And we're really going to start to see some cool, innovative stuff going on, on a local level, especially. And so that's why I've been focusing mostly on Rewild Portland the last few years. And that's why I abandoned the Urban Scout Project in favor of Rewild Portland was because, you know, I created Rewild.com and my blog, UrbanScout.org, as a means of encouraging more rewilding and to find more rewilders so that I could eventually live an immediate return hunter gather life way with a group of people. Um, that was my main goal in my early 20s. And the more I tried to make that happen, the more I realized the complexity of our situation and the depth of captivity of people and the extent of civilization's coercion and violence. And so it made me kind of reevaluate things in terms of the long term plan and the long con, you know, sort of like the Shawshank Redemption. Uh, you know, slowly and secretly digging my way out of the prison. And that's kind of how I see Rewild Portland in a lot of ways is this vehicle to, it's a doorway. It's not the end goal by any means. It's a doorway to bring more people locally to rewilding. Because what I saw happen was on the rewild.com forum, you know, we had hundreds of people interacting on there, but nothing was still happening right here. What It didn't bring me any closer to an immediate return hunter-gatherer lifeway than I had been before I even started it. But what it did do was, you know, catalyze, catalyze the movement of rewilding on a larger scale, especially um, as far as the internet zeitgeist goes, to the point where now you have, there's this really great article online called Mops, Geeks, and Sociopaths in Subcultural Evolution, I think is what the title of it. But basically this guy breaks down how subcultures work. And, and initially you have like the creators and then you have fanatics. So you have like the creators of a subculture and then you have fanatics. And fanatics are like the geeks, essentially. They're the people who are really into the subculture. Some of them, you know, usually fan fanatics are also the creators, but the fanatics don't necessarily have to be creators. They're just really in support of the creators. And eventually a scene can get big enough to the point where it starts to attract what he calls mops. And I forget that's an acronym for something, but once it attracts mops, mops are people who are not fanatics. They're not like super invested in it. They just want to be part of it. They like the idea of the new cool thing and they want to like have that as part of their aesthetic, but not necessarily be fully in great, in integrated into that thing, right? So mops are great for money because they want to, they'll spend money. They want to consume the cool. They're not going to create it. They're not going to stick around and be part of the scene, but they want to buy it, you know? And there's a lot more mops than there are fanatics. And once that ratio gets to a certain extent, that's when a subculture attracts sociopaths because fanatic are, because creators don't necessarily know how to make money off of the thing that they made cool, but sociopaths are great at it in a capitalistic economy. And once there's enough mops interested, mops are the people with money. So sociopaths will come in and they look like the creators, only cooler. They talk like the creators, only cooler. And they might even do some creating themselves. But in the end, what they do is monetize the thing, make a new rewilding light or whatever it is light and sell it to mops. And basically the subculture collapses because you no longer have that core of fanatics that were keeping it alive. And it's become this consumable thing. And it's a really great, really, really great, interesting anatomy of a, of a subculture. And so, you know, I think what I what part I played in that was as a. Some people perceived me, I think, initially as one of those sociopaths coming into like anarcho-primitivism and promoting it on this larger scale. 
but I was never profiting off of it. I was a creator in my own right. I was not necessarily accepted into the core of like anarcho primitivism, but I was a creator in the way of taking rewilding to a larger audience. I never lightened it. I never watered the message down. I just transformed the aesthetic of it slightly. Um, I took out the A word, but I didn't change the ideas at all other than taking out the A word, anarchism or anarchy. And I think I kind of paved the way accidentally by creating this internet zeitgeist of what rewilding was to open the door for sociopaths to come in and capitalize off of rewilding, which we see regularly now. But I still think it doesn't. I, I don't think I, I disagree, I think, in, in terms with that article that that's like the end of a subculture. I think that's just another phase of it that can destroy it, but it can also strengthen it in other ways. His solution was in order to fill the niche that sociopaths fill, you have to yourself as a creator be slightly evil. <laughs> and I totally agree with that, you know, and I feel like if people like you and I, I feel like you could probably speak to this too. It's like, you know, we have a difficult time trying to monetize what we do. But in a capitalistic world, we have to be slightly evil to protect all these ideas and keep them alive from people who want to take them and make them a light watered down version that they can sell on a mass scale. And in, and in doing so effectively destroy the original concept or the radicalness, and by that I mean the root cause, getting, you know, the root aspects of subcultures. Anyway, that's that's a long side note. I do think, though, that it's important to the conversation to at least have an awareness of that, however, because what you kind of outlined in your own experiences through what this article illustrated is something that I've experienced in various music scenes over and over and over again, having been in the, you know, the punk revival during the 90s, then I was an elect an industrial rivet head and still kind of am, but getting to watch those evolutions of when something kind of like hits and becomes popular. And then it's waiting to ride out that wave of popularity to see who's still going to be around afterwards. Yeah. I mean, um, and there's a, you know, there is an interesting twist to, I think, people who are making this rewilding light is that there's still elements of the philosophy, I think, that are deep enough that a lot of people who are attracted to it from some of that, that realm are looking for the deeper aspect of it, and they will find it. You know, there's the, I think, my friend Zach says, real finds real. And I, I think that that's true. So as long as there's, I think, a core of the creators in terms of rewilding and anarcho primitive and stuff really holding down or towing the line. I think that those people who are doing the, the light versions of that will eventually bring in a lot more people to the deeper and less superficial aspects of it. So it's both has the potential for negative positive at the same time. So I think whatever ends up coming out of this thing will be stronger in the long run. That doesn't make it any less emotional for people like me who kind of have to witness it and feel how many face palms do I have to do, you know? So after doing this online thing, I want to reel it back into, uh, you know, having my book come out, doing the online thing and realizing that there wasn't, um, that I wasn't any closer to this immediate return on undergathered life way. I was like, wow, I need to do something about this. And so that's when I started rewild Portland. And the idea was, originally to try to get people who were part of the rewild.com forum to start their own rewild whatever town they lived in and back then there was this thing i'm sure it still exists now it's called bar camp and it's part of the tech industry and they have a, a conference every month that's an informal conference an unconference just a, a gathering of people like a, a kind of a social uh, mixer or whatever that's called drink night once a month and then once a year they have like a weekend conference and it's called bar camp because they originally had a tech conference that was called foo camp and it was an invite invite only camp for 100 of the top tech people in the world and of course a lot of tech people are anarchists and so they had, there was a massive backlash against an invite only conference in that regard so they started this thing called bar camp because foo bar means fucked up beyond all recognition and hacker lingo and so they created Bar Camp. Bar Camp was open to anybody, was a collective community run thing. And they sprouted up in like every major city. And it was basically just a social networking opportunity for fellow tech people. So I wanted to piggyback on that idea. And I created this thing called Rewild Camp. And the idea behind Rewild Camp was the same thing. Have all these different people in different cities across the country or the world really create their own free Skillshare uh, once a month. And so we started doing this in Portland back in like 2000, well, the first 2007, 
but uh, we started doing it regularly in 2009. And that's when I incorporated Rewild Portland as a non-for-profit and was trying to get more people to pick this up. But I think back then there wasn't enough momentum. I mean, obviously the tech industry is a huge financially backed industry. So people who are meeting all have jobs. It's a There's an economic basis for the social networking aspect of their program that I think is what made it sticky. Back then, you know, rewilding was just a an idea. It's a, a moral, you know, it's a it's a social movement. It's not backed by financial in any way. And so there wasn't really a, a draw, I think, for it to happen on a larger scale. I think there is potential for that, but it has to come from a different way. And so I've been trying to make Rewild Portland the example. And so other people can look at Rewild Portland, see what we're doing, and then be able to create it across the world and basically create pockets of rewilding communities everywhere. And then that to me is sort of the... The collective goal of rewilding is to make it happen for as many people in as many places and to make it as accessible as possible for as many people in as many places to actually make it a movement that's going to last. Uh, And so that's what I've been focusing on for the last five, six, seven years is rewild Portland. And this year, it just keeps getting more and more interest, more and more people coming. Our free skill share happens on the last Saturday of every month. And it's kind of blown up to this crazy thing. We've had like 85 people coming to them now. And you know, kind of so many people were not even quite sure what to do with, which is great, you know, and we'll see where it goes from here. It just keeps getting more and more complex of a picture. Again, we're more of an urban, uh, an urban perspective of rewilding. So it's a little different, I feel, than what people would do in the country or more places that are further away from civilized centers. But of course, we get out there too, as part of our programs is to get people to less civilized areas, more diverse populations. And so then is reissuing Rewild or Die at this time, after having spent so many years on it in your earlier days, and then now in kind of this middle period, building Rewild Portland, is this kind of to close that chapter while making this material available as you move forward with creating more of these, I must think of it in parallel with like the transition town movement, like the rewilding town. I never really felt felt like I did Urban Scout justice to what it needed, that that muse never felt at rest. You know, kind of like a, a spirit that needed needed to be honored before it would go away. And I feel like this is finally that that uh, the honoring that muse that it really needed. And now it'll be gone, and I can move on. I think the muse in particular. I I think that seeing this sort of monetized or sociopathic invasion of rewilding made that muse angrier (laughs) because that book wasn't available, you know, and I think that that was doing a disservice to the larger rewilding movement by not having it available because I do think it's a little bit more accessible than a lot of the the books out there on rewilding. And so broadly encompassing. So I'm glad that it's out there now. And I feel like that'll appease the spirits uh, of urban scout at least. And I really do enjoy it, as I mentioned in the beginning, as an entry point because of how much you cover. And because my own experience with rewilding was really conservation rewilding and rewilding the landscape, bringing back things like our keystone predators and the megafauna to different areas. And then my exposure to you and Jason, as I say, some of the others has really opened my eyes to how much we can do individually to kind of disconnect ourselves from civilization. Though I do have to ask, in re-releasing this book, are you going to have to defend yourself against yourself moving forward as your ideas change it's funny you say that you know even when i published the original version i had this introduction that said hey you know please don't think that i believe any of the things in this book (laughs) 10 years from now i might not believe any of it i might call something you know i might have something else entirely so i even had that kind of apprehension when i put it out initially you know there's a big problem with any kind of philosophy i think or writing philosophy is that you might not you might not agree with it as you as you learn more as you experience more I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind about anybody who writes anything really is that their views can change and sometimes they change rapidly and sometimes they don't change at all. But in the second introduction, <laughs> so now, now the book has a foreword and an introduction. The third version will have an afterword and an epilogue. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and in the foreword, I kind of even reiterate it like a second time or, you know, just saying, hey, you know, like I don't agree with a lot of stuff. This voice isn't my voice. But I still find value in having these ideas out there, because even though I disagree with them, I still think it's important to have them as part of the conversation. And I'm not a fundamentalist, at least I try not to be. I think we all are, because I think we are bred 
in a fundamentalist culture. So we're used to that kind of ideology, but I'm trying as much as I can to break free of that. And I think that being able to talk about an idea and have a conversation about something that I don't fully agree with anymore or that I did uh, speaks to the ability to not have um, a fundamentalist attitude. I also think that there's an element of black and white thinking that doesn't help. You know, I think that the fundamentalism really helps or maybe is a, a branch off of of this dualism of black and white thinking rather than looking at complexity and paradox as the norm. You know, there's this idea that everything has to be linear and black and white. And I just don't think that that's how the world works. So when people freak out and say that, you know, there has to be this way or the other way, that's when I turn around and walk the other direction. Because honestly, I don't think that person's going to be able to see complexity. And I don't even think it's a value or a good use of my time to try to discuss that with them. And I think that's an interesting thing. You know, there's my friend Willem. I, I get negative reviews of Rewild or Die and I get positive reviews. There's nobody in the middle. It's either they hate it or they love it. And I think it has to do with that complexity. Either people understand complexity and paradox or they're unable to, to see that at all. And they're unable to understand that. And I don't, I have a hard time. I don't think there's really a middle ground. No, that's okay. Like not everybody has to see complexity or, or, you know, seeing black and white can help us understand things. I think it's good to have neurodiversity and, and multiple perspectives on things. So I'm glad that it exists, but that's my unparadoxical persona or personality that, uh, that appreciates that. Whereas I don't think that fundamentalists generally appreciate uh, a paradoxical point of view or uh, a view of complexity. So that's a challenge in and of itself, but I, I still value every contribution, even the negative reviews that I get are valuable to me and to other people who are reading the book because everybody has different perspectives. So even if somebody has a negative review, I want to honor that and honor their perspective and uh, understand how they perceived the words, whether I meant intended them that way or not. How is How are they being perceived by different people? There's so many things that I'd like to comment on and take in a different direction on what you just said, but the one that stands out for me is that in some of the things that I've been exposed to recently that have reminded me of my own studies of culture and anthropology over the years is that this very hard duality seems to be something that is relatively recent in the way that we interact with one another because historically there were all of these ways socially that we could relieve that kind of pressure and that it wasn't about arguing about the one percent that divided us um but rather remembering the 99 percent that we connect with other human beings about and that you know we could have festivals and arguments in the street that could be very angry but the next day we still had to go back and see that person because they were the person who made our shoes or would come out and take care of our animals when they were sick. And I just wonder if that's something about where our culture has moved over the last several generations that allows for that kind of separation that speaks more to that privilege economically and otherwise that allows us to remain separate from our neighbor. going to keep tooting the rewild Portland horn here, but getting people together in a place to work on a skill and do the free Skillshare, you know, for me, it's about getting people connected and, and creating a social connection rather than just uh, teaching a skill. Because to me, social, the social aspects are the most important aspects of rewilding. You know, primitive skills, let's be honest, they're easy. And if you think they're hard, you just haven't met the right person or the right teacher um, or the right cultural context for them. But primitive skills are ridiculously easy. They're so easy. They just take a lot of time. You know, creating a knife out of a bone, all it takes is a rock and a knife and 30 hours. You know, I mean, it's just it's just easy. The difficult things are the things we've been ingrained about how we perceive the world and how we interact with one another. It's the psychological stuff that is the most challenging, not the handcrafts. And that, but the handcrafts are sexy. And so, <laughs> you know, they draw people in, but then once we, we use that to draw people in, and then from there, we can kind of create deeper social connections and social ties, which is the, the ultimate goal, that and tending the wild, or trying to come up with a way of, of saying tending the wild that doesn't necessarily mean a horticultural lifestyle, but that can bring in all aspects of immediate return hunter-gatherer to the tending the wild horticulturalist type people's because I feel like there's this interesting 
divide among people who want to do a media return hunter gather lifestyle because they think that there's no impact or that humans aren't making an impact. But I do think that immediate return hunter gatherers have uh, recognized their impact on the environment and do so in a way that has a net benefit for them, because I think that's what all animals do. So I think of humans not really being conscious of our actions and how it affects the environment, because I do think animals are conscious of that to an extent. And so I'm trying to think of a way of looking at tending the wild that you know, can look at it through not necessarily the the lens of intensification, the way that we see a progression of intensification from a media to gather lifestyle to turn into horticulture, but rather one that acknowledges that the impact that we make doesn't have to be a destructive one inherently, and that's a that that's a conscious decision. Anyway, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. That's not coming out of left field, but. It makes sense, and it speaks to some of the issues that I see within the permaculture community because growing food is easy. Growing food in a regenerative way isn't that much harder. If we want to talk about whether or not we can feed the current global population using horticultural permaculture methods, that's a different piece of it. But really, when it comes to getting down to the work and getting it done, it's really the social side of things that's that's the hardest. And I'm seeing that in some of the groups that I'm interacting with that I spend so much time working virtually. I mean, you know, you're on the other side of the continent having this conversation with me, thanks to the joys of the internet. But there is a deep need that when my local groups are having meetings to show up, to be there in person, even if that means that, you know, there could be other things that might necessarily be more productive in my time as like a small business owner and all the other things that I do, but that if the movements that we're involved in are really going to grow, we have to put the time in shoulder to shoulder with those folks around us, whether that means we're planting a garden, learning a primitive skill, or just sharing a meal together. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, where I'm going right now with rewilding is sort of the social justice element, because I want to make rewilding accessible to everyone and I want to know what the barriers are for everyone. And so being able to recognize those barriers and dismantle them however way I can, if that's because I have, I'm in a privileged position more than somebody else or for whatever reason, that to me is kind of the next level of of where I think rewilding needs to go is really in the social justice aspect of rewilding because really, you know, hunter gatherers in immediate return life ways, uh, they had egalitarian cultures for the most part. And so in a sense, rewilding should be looked at as a return to that, as a return to uh, social justice, you know. But of course, it wouldn't be social justice in that world because there wouldn't need to be that, you know, in theory. But to me, that's the the most important thing is making rewilding accessible to a large audience so that it can be an actual movement instead of just a bunch of people talking about it or a few folks living, you know, in the woods somewhere. Does that mean that you'll be writing Rewild and Live here in a couple of years? Uh, Yeah, I'm working on it. But this next year, my resolution, my New Year's resolution is to really to step away from any creative endeavors in that regard, writing or otherwise, and really just establish Rewild Portland's programs and spend next year just doing that solely. Um, And it hasn't really been something that I've done. So Uh, and then the following year, I think I'll focus on the next book, which will heavily be influenced by my experiences creating Rewild Portland because I want it to be a model. Um, And so that'll be part of the book. So you've given us a bit of the history of what brought you to write Rewild or Die, what your current activities are, and where you see yourself going in the future. With all of that shared with us today, what are your final thoughts for the listeners so that we might draw this conversation to a close? Um, My final thoughts are... Uh, I'm going to do a pitch for Rewild Portland this month. We're doing our fundraiser. It's an online fundraiser, so anywhere can anywhere any you know anybody anywhere can donate. And really, my pitch is that we're really trying to be a model for other people. And so, if we're going to push this vision to the next level, we need to grow as an organization. And you, a donation would really help us to do that. And really, a donation to Rewild Portland in that sense is a donation to the vision of rewilding and seeing it grow and uh, come to the next level of fruition. Because the more we can grow, the more we're going to be setting the example for other organizations out there. And especially, I think, because we have that social justice-minded and environmental justice-minded aspects to our organization, that that's an important and integral part of that. And I don't see that in a lot of other rewilding organizations that are out there. And 
So in that regard, I would really encourage people to help us reach our goal and, and to donate. And thank you for your time and thank you for considering. And thank you for joining me today, Peter. As always, I enjoy every time that you're on the show and get a chance for us to talk and share this with the world. Thank you so much. And that was Peter Michael Bauer. You can find out more about his current work at rewildportland.com, as well as in the show notes for this episode at thepermaculturepodcast.com, where you'll find links to their current online fundraiser, as well as a number of different ways that you can get involved or connected, including through the rewild.com forums or the rewild.com Facebook page. And while you're there, I've included some links to some other material that has really had a big impact on my understanding of what it means to be a human being rewilding myself and struggling against the bonds of civilization. One of those includes Jason Gadeski, a longtime friend and supporter of this show and an ongoing sponsor, who's creating the game The Fifth World, which examines the way that we can imagine the future 400 years from now as we live in an ecotopia, in touch with our land base and creating new customs. For Patreon supporters, I have a piece I'll be posting soon That was a conversation between myself, Jason, and Julie LaManna about creating a family within the fifth world where you can learn about how we can imagine creating new customs from the ones that we currently have and the traditions that we hold right here, right now, that we might want to pass on to future generations. Another link that I include is to Children of Wormwood, which is a novel set in the future of the fifth world by Juliana Maria LaManna that I also recommend that you read to give you an idea of what that future could hold. As I said in the intro, Rewild or Die has been a really influential book on my ongoing work about what it means to create community and live in the world that we want to see. Many years ago, I had some conversations with Mark Lakeman and Larry Santoyo and Dave Jackie that started my thinking moving away from the landscape and more to the social and economic systems. At the time, that was the big picture. And as that became more refined, I looked more and more towards what it meant to live with one another and in community, which has been my exploration for the last year or so. But even now, that's moving even further as I explore the work of David Fleming and Sean Chamberlain through Surviving the Future and Lean Logic, which I have some interviews with Sean coming up here in the next couple of weeks, but also through reading Peter's work and understanding what it means to really get back in touch with the land base. I don't see permaculture or the current rewilding movement as what will make the difference in the end. It'll be something that we haven't even imagined yet. But these are the tools that we can use while we ourselves continue to unshackle ourselves from civilization and from all of these structures, such as the hierarchy and capitalism of modern democracy, and move more towards a life that considers not only people, but also the other than human, so that those generations that we will never meet will be the ones who are free from what was built before we were here. If you want to pick up a copy of Rewild or Die, there is a link in the show notes where you can get that. Pick up a copy, add it to your library, read it. Know that there are some times when Urban Scout comes across as an unreliable narrator but in doing so challenges us to ask ourselves what is real and what is meaningful. I'd like to end this episode with a reading from the very end of Rewild or Die. Go out there and start rewilding now. Plant an orchard. Protect wild lands. Teach your children that weeds don't exist. Talk with other than humans. Talk with humans. Shut down the grid. Learn to hunt and trap without modern tools. Take out roads. Make a family. Turn a deer skin into buckskin. Hold your ground. Make friends. Discover enemies. Reclaim land from civilization. Get really fucking angry. Relax. Cry. Laugh. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. Follow your heart and live a life worth living, worth remembering, worth mythologizing until the sun engulfs the planet. You have a choice. Rewild or die. What are your thoughts after hearing this interview and learning a bit more about Rewild or Die, Urban Scout, Peter Michael Bauer, and Rewild Portland? I'd love to hear from you. 
show at thepermaculturepodcast.com, call 717-827-6266, or drop something in the mail. The Permaculture Podcast, P.O. Box 16, Dauphin, Pennsylvania, 17018. Until the next time, create the world that you want to live in. Learn what it means to rewild, and take care of Earth, yourself, and each other.